So everyone, before we kick off, welcome to today. We're going to start off with these polls. So um, first question, right out of the gate. Over the past 10 years, there have been 60 plus startups in Australia that have reached valuations of 100 million or more. The question is how many of these have been bootstrapped? When we say bootstrapped, it means no, found, no funding at all to get there. Michael, I'm wondering if you know the answer to this question. Jeez, that is hard, but uh, I actually go with 10 plus. Oh no, I might be affecting the poll, but um, I don't know the answer either. Interesting, isn't it? I love the live voting. <laughs> That's great, isn't it? All right, so we're ending up with one to five. It looks like we've got 45% of people are saying one to five, but our expert here, Michael, is on D, 10 plus. I wonder if I, if I mentioned that, it could change a little bit. So um, the right answer, in fact, is one to five. Yeah, right. And so that's really interesting how, how few companies uh, over the past 10 years have actually been able to bootstrap the whole way, the whole way through. Um, and if you, yeah, you think about that, that's in some, some respects still quite a lot. I believe the number is actually uh, four or five. So it's just on that mark. So thanks. Next, next poll. Josh. All right. So last year, how many companies in Australia received early stage VC or angel funding? So this is in total, how many companies? There are thousands of companies set up every single year, thousands of startups being started. How many received VC or angel funding in one year? How many deals were there? Michael, what do you reckon? <laughs> uh, I would go with B as well. Looks like there's a the majority there too. But again, like I have no idea. I know we fund 30 startups, but I don't know if we, <laughs> if we count in there. So 43% of you are on 150. So something staggering. So start, make, fund and Blackbird fund 30 of them. But in total, there were only 138 early stage deals. So this is from VCs or registered angels. So sort of sophisticated startup focused investors. But the answer is, correct answer is A. So 32% of you, well done. 138 is the right answer. Less than 150. We got one more question before we launch into everything. All right. So how many accelerator <laughs> programs are there in Australia? Jeez. So this is a give or take situation. I mean, I'm hoping Michael knows the answer to this one. Oh, geez. I, I know there's a lot. Um, Surely not 132, 173. If anything, I would go with um, 58 or 94 and... Give us one. Ooh. All right, I'm going with B as well. Go with the majority oh, finally. there. Finally. <laughs> At least one. 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 <laughs> <laughs> well done, everyone. You, uh, you, uh, you nailed that, 56% B. Um, so thanks, Josh, for all of that. So what's... What I really want us to, to think about and, and, and why I wanted to start with that is I wanted to set the scene for today's conversation. You know, funding is really, really important, but it's, it's not everything. It's a, a stepping stone, not the aim. Uh, in fact, although there's only few companies that don't get funding, it's still possible. You can bootstrap all the way, but chances are as you saw from those numbers, you'll probably need it at some point. And then from what we saw in terms of the numbers of deals that happen per year, it's actually really hard to get. You need to be that combo of a great operator, great team, uh, addressing a, a ambitious problem in the world and actually solving um, your customers' pain points. And so today is all about giving you uh, a better chance, not, not of getting funding, but of navigating the system. Uh, and the system often starts with accelerator programs. I guess a way I think about accelerator programs, it's a little bit of like the top of the funnel of the big company unicorn building sort of 
funnel. It, it starts right up at the top. And we're super fortunate today to have, uh, I guess, Australia's boffin in accelerator programs, literally um, an expert in this field, uh, Michael Batko, the CEO of Startmate, which if you don't know, Startmate is uh, Australia's most successful, biggest uh, most well-known leader in all things accelerator and startup support. I should probably say New Zealand as well. Um, and so we're really pr privileged to have Michael, the CEO here today to help us uh, explore this topic and, and, and increase your chances of, of success at, uh, at navigating that system. So in terms of setting up today, we're going to be exploring all things accelerator programs from uh, how they can support you and your startup, who they're right for, tips and tricks uh, for getting in and winning, but we're also gonna get an insight into Michael and, and Startmate because they are some of the best business operators in Australia. And um, as a founder myself and a lot of founders out there, there's a lot we can learn from them. So, hi everyone. Now I will uh, intro myself for those of you who don't know me. I'm Renan Heine, the CEO and founder of Luna. Uh, we have a really simple mission to help entrepreneurs launch and grow better businesses. Uh, we do that through a range of different um, services, legal, accounting, grants, uh, support. We have an education business and then sometimes we provide funding as well. Uh, here today, you've all come to a Control uh, N event. This is our platform for sharing knowledge, information, and resources for founders to build better businesses. So welcome everyone. Thanks for signing uh, up to today's webinar. Uh, the structure, um, before getting over to Michael in a second, uh, I guess the flow for you to, uh, to consider is that it's going to be a, about a 40 minute conversation between Michael and I, um, and then we're going to come back to, to Q&A at the end. We're going to discuss all those things I, I mentioned before, uh, I really, really want some questions from you. Uh, I would love uh, stuff uh, to ask Michael questions along the way. Uh, very, very important. Please use the Q&A function rather than the chat. Uh, we'll be looking at the Q&A specifically for questions. So if you have questions for Michael, pop them along the way. Um, I'll try weave them in, but we'll also have an allocated time at the very end to come back uh, to actually answer those questions. Uh, in the chat group, another thing to notice, so there's another function in the chat down there. Uh, Josh from our team will be my co-pilot here. So we like to run a co-pilot situation. He'll be putting in some comments, maybe even dropping in some resources into that chat channel. So if you have any questions or you, you want to know a buzzword that's been dropped and you can't follow the conversation, feel free to put it in there and, and Josh will uh, get you a response. So with all of that, Michael, welcome. Thanks, uh, thanks so much for having me. Uh, so it is, uh, it's a privilege to have you. I'm, I'm so excited to have you on and um, explore this topic. And I think we can see by the, the number of people signed up to this webinar, it's been one of our, our most popular and uh, it's such a, such an important topic in terms of, uh, you know, today, um, but I, I truly believe with the, the future that lies ahead in, in so many Australians now engaging in entrepreneurship, um, you know, the, the future of the world looks very different. Tech is now at the, the forefront. Accelerated programs play a critical role. So I'm so excited to get into that topic. But before getting into that topic, uh, I just wanted to um, chat a little bit about you. So in preparation for this conversation, I made a couple of phone calls. Oh. So I called some people to, you know, get the lowdown on what's Michael like. And, um, you know, I've worked with you a little bit, so I had this feeling, but the common theme was always, he's so efficient. He's so productive. He's like the ultimate pro. In fact, uh, Adam Milgram, someone I, I contacted said that you were the most responsive emailer in the, in the world. <laughs> so with all of this, I just wanted to kick off. How did you, how did you get this reputation as uh, as Mr. Productivity? <laughs> um, not sure if that's right, but um, that, that's absolutely flattering. Um, um, I just love, um, I just kind of see myself always as um, how like time is limited in life. So how can you make the most out of it? And, um, and that's why I always want to never be the bottleneck for people and always be able to scale myself. 
and in the kind of mission to scale myself, I dig really deep into different systems and I always try to use different tools and whether it's Gmail or Trello or anything else kind of to its absolute limits. So I always love to experiment and just try different features out. And then when I discover those, I love them, implement them into my work um, workflow. And then that's when people usually observe it and think I'm productive, but ultimately all I am is actually just really lazy. And I just always try to find shortcuts to get things done faster. Um, so that's probably where it kind of comes from. Yeah, it's interesting because as a receiver of your productivity, I guess you think it's something that's totally natural, but I can see you put a lot of hard work into it. It's not just something that stumbles out. And um, so on that theme of hard work, I know you at Startmate have been working really hard to grow the Australian ecosystem. Uh, again, just looking at some numbers, uh, I found that so that you've invested in 100 plus companies uh, over the past since since inception um and you've got a you've you've, uh, you've said that the valuation of those companies is in excess of one billion dollars um i think they most of those companies would probably come in with about a million dollar valuation so it looks like there's 10 times growth there presumably mostly from early stage companies only over the past few years so uh it's a pretty pretty exceptional impact that you've had on the ecosystem um i guess i just wanted to explore startmate uh, your role as CEO. Um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, how you ended up as the CEO of Startmate and uh, as well a little bit about um, Startmate, what you're doing and uh, how you're building the ecosystem in Australia? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and for everybody else on the call as well, actually just like popping questions as you go and absolutely encourage them and we can answer them as we go as well. Um, but it actually might be worth mentioning at that stage as well, like all of Startmate success. I mean, that is built on all of my predecessors and all of the awesome mentors we have. Um, so Startme started in 2011 and actually back then, uh, I mean, just to, to share a bit of the history, it was um, Nikki Shavak was also the Blackbird co-founder um, who returned back from Silicon Valley and saw in Australia, there was just no venture capital. Um, so him as an ex-founder um, decided to bring um, alongside him another 15, 20 mentors who are all founders and ex-founders and they all were just like, hey, why don't we invest? $10,000 of our own money to invest in startups and actually help them out. Like the whole empathy of founders helping founders because they've been through the journey and they can give you the best possible advice. And um, alongside Nikki was um, Mike and Brooks and Scott Farquhar, the co-founders of Atlassian. Um, and they all kind of put the skin in the game or like, if you succeed, we succeed. And from then onwards, kind of started it grew and grew and grew into and because those incentives are so beautifully aligned between mentors wanting to help you and the founders. Um, but how did I get to where I am? So initially it was founded by Nikki. Um, when, and then in roughly, Nikki was working part-time on Startmate back in the day until 2016, roughly. Then Nick Crocker took the reins in 2017, expanded Startmate to, um, to Melbourne. So initially we were Sydney focused. Um, he expanded Startmate to Melbourne. Um, James Tynan, Tynan took the reins in um, 2018 and that's when I actually joined um, Startmate um, as a head of operations so as you mentioned earlier kind of like the whole productivity is close to my heart and so um, I, I maybe actually go into my journey of how did I even end up in Startmate it was quite an interesting one in a way that um, I'm a classic business student I did business and management had no idea what I wanted to do with my uh, with my life and kind of went into, well, every company needs a little bit of finance. And I actually started in American Express doing P&Ls and balance sheets and, and Google Sheets and Excel files. And um, but then quickly, quickly realized that it's actually working with people, which I loved and um, joined again as a classic business student, did a master's in international management, which was the most general thing I could even find on the curriculum. And um, joined um, consulting actually in PwC and KPMG. But then again, there I was just like, oh, I do lots of talking, but I actually don't do anything kind of work related um, as in real work and um, I moved to Australia about six years ago when I started working for Mad Pause. Um, so actually um, for you, for some of you who know Mad Pause, it's a, it's a marketplace for pet sitters. So you go on a holiday and you have a dog or a cat and you want them uh, to be taken care of by somebody and find somebody other marketplace. And there was literally just the two of us back in the day. And um, we scaled it kind of to a series A and then left and um, joined Expert360, which is marketplace for independent consultants. 
and I swear I'm already ending that story because it's getting really long, but I'm an expert of six you raised a series A and a series B. And when I left, there was kind of the whole idea of, um, I love startups. I love impacting, having a real impact on customers and on people's lives. And the whole idea was how can I help 30 companies instead of one? And similar to that, what I was saying earlier, like how can I scale myself? <laughs> and that was kind of my thing. And I was just like, well, the natural fit here is, um, kind of go into VC or go into an accelerator. And for, for VC, it was kind of the whole thing of, well, you give people money, but you actually don't help them hands on. Whereas the accelerator path was like, well, you fund startups and you can actually make a really big impact on them. And that's how I ended up in StartMate as head of operations, um, where I've been now for almost three years and, and was promoted to the CEO role about a year ago. Uh, so long story short, that's, that's how I got here. Fantastic. And I know, I mean, you've had pretty great growth over the past three years, haven't you? It kind of, what, what, what's happened in the, the shorter term just to set the scene of where you were in three years ago to, to right now? Yeah, totally. So um, three years ago to now, I mean, um, lots and lots of things happened. Like um, on a fund size, um, StartMate raises a half million dollar fund every six months for each cohort. And so two years ago, that was a half million dollars. Now we raise a one and a half million dollar fund. So we've kind of tripled that which is uh, allows us to put more money into our startup support and post accelerator as well and do follow-on funding which is super exciting and helps our alumni raise money as well and um, on the other side we um, launched a fellowship which is essentially an accelerator for operators so if you want to hire somebody awesome um, it's basically that a fellowship where you, we get lots and lots of operators and um, from finance marketing etc in to get them hired by startups um, and um, actually, next that we'll be launching a product for investors as well. So actually, that, that's mm-hmm. just worth mentioning. What is StartMate? Like StartMate is actually a little bit more than Accelerator by now. Um, I mean, now like nine, ten years later, where we where we want to be is that cross section where all those roads come together of people wanting to found a company, being a founder, and um, join a company, being an operator, and invest in the company, which is an investor. And we want to be. We are actually that that middle ground of all three of them coming together. I see, see how your tagline fits in of being the, the center of startup gravity in, in uh, Australia and New Zealand fits into that. Uh, so I'm really glad you brought up the fun side to, to uh, start, mate. I think it's important as founders, uh, when you go into any deal relationship, uh, it's, you know, whether that's with customers or investors, it's important to understand the other side. So if you're a, a founder out there, it's in, uh, important for you to, understand, I guess, the investor mindset or your customer's mindset to know, to know what side they're coming from. So I'm just interested just for a moment, if you could explain to us, I guess, um, a lot of the founders here are thinking about going into an accelerator, wanting to apply. What's the business model of the accelerator? Um, you can speak generally here or, you know, start made or, or, or whatever you like, but just so that the founders can get an understanding of who they're going into business with, who they're forming a relationship, what what's the business model of a, an accelerator program? And I guess, you know, what, what looks like winning for an accelerator program? Mm. Yeah, right. Okay. Two questions there. So business model and kind of like, um, what are the incentives of an accelerator and um, business model, like uh, from a really high level, yeah, the way you can think about accelerators is, um, or actually really anything in life, <laughs> you can think about the way people are incentivized by where do they get the money from? Um, so with accelerators, the same thing. You can es- essentially put accelerators in four different buckets. The first one is the government funded. Um, so the problem which they have is they need government funding every two or three years. They've got an uncertain future, whether they will get the government funding in the future, et cetera. Second bucket is the corporate accelerator. So they usually get money from um, the big corporates of the world, whether that's um, Telstra, KPMG, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and here again, like, because they get money from the corporates, think about like what incentivizes the accelerator then to, to show the stakeholders what good looks like. So that means usually you have senior executives in those corporates engage in those startups and help you out. If this is what you want, that's the accelerator for you. The third one is um, the university accelerator. So this is, for example, uh, Monash is the generator, which is great. You've got uh, Melbourne Uni with the MAP program, and you've got Sydney Uni with Incubate, you've got UNSW with UNSW 10X, Etc. So here it's um, a university accelerator where I usually you need to have a connection to the university somehow to be part of it. Um, and again, here the stakeholder is the university. So what they need to be able to show is that they develop kind of the alumni. 
The fourth um, accelerator, obviously, I'm massively biased here because that's StartMate, um, is the kind of venture capital um, funded one, or not necessarily venture capital one, because the only one which kind of exists in that space, or the biggest one, is Y Combinator, where StartMate is even a little bit different to that, where um, for us, as I mentioned with our StartMate history, is every single one of our mentors is a founder, an ex-founder, or somebody who joined a startup at a very early stage and, and scaled a business unit. And every single one of our mentors is also an investor in the StartMate fund, which is actually a really interesting dynamic now because every single one of our, their mentors invest a personal $10,000 into the cohort. So that means they're actually equally invested in every single company. And here the incentive, when you think about it, is really interesting again because every single mentor as part of the program actually has money invested in your success. Therefore, they want to actually help you as much as possible. Um, yeah, so four different models there, um, all three with the pros, and, uh, all four with the pros and cons. And um, so that that's a really good framework to think about if you're applying for an accelerator. Does do their incentives align with the ones you want to get out of? Yeah. And then, so how about you as CEO of an accelerator, I guess, your board or the, the people, your stakeholders, um, what does success look like for you? Is it, is it return on investment? Is it like number of startups supported, you know, um, a venture capital of, of fund, of course, is focused on return on investment for their LPs. But you mentioned before an accelerator is slightly different because it's the funding and the support. So hmm. I guess, what does success look like for you? As the yeah, absolutely. Of an so, um, I guess there's two different hats which um, I wear. Is on the one side, absolutely the investor hat. So we are um, absolutely a venture capital investment where we are driving the um, the best outcomes for our investors. Which means every single startup we invest in, we believe that this can genuinely be a huge company, and they will be able to return the fund. So there's absolutely a financial component there. And um, every single one of our, uh, our funds have been performing really well, which is why StartMed has been doing as well as it has. Um, the second aspect, because StartMed is more than an accelerator now, is absolutely the community aspect of things. Like, it is so important to us to have a thriving community, which kind of comes back into what I was saying earlier, that we're at a crossroad of, um, of founders, operators, and investors. Because the beautiful thing we see in every single cohort, again, is, well, Statistically speaking, nine out of the 10 companies in each cohort will fail and one will go on to succeed. Succeed, when I, what I mean by succeed is basically hire dozens and hundreds of people and get a, a big valuation. But a really interesting thing which we actually see and love is that that one company then ends, ends up hiring all the other fellows, uh, founders out of that cohort and actually all of our alumni as well. And actually keeping that community thriving is again like another KPI which we have. And mm. huge, um, Such problems. an interesting angle because I don't know that many founders would, I mean, it, it kind of makes the accelerator program a little bit like a career progression program, whether your business succeeds or, or doesn't succeed because there's so many opportunities opened up by the network. So moving into, uh, I guess, coming into the program, getting into the program, again, I can see that about 75% plus of people on this on this webinar, founders of early stage companies themselves. What, who, who's most ideally suited to an accelerator program? Um, what, what stage uh, and, you know, what business type? Hmm. Um, yeah, good question here. Like um, overall, um, any stage in any type of business can go for an accelerator. It just really depends on what you want to get out of the accelerator. So as I've started, we are completely um, industry agnostic. So we invest in anything from hard, hardware, software, aerospace, um, biotech, etc. cetera. Um, on the stage side, we are also pretty agnostic here. We love investing super early, um, MVP stage, first couple of customer stage. But then again, that being said, we also do invest in companies at a, at a million dollars in revenue kind of thing. So... What I'm trying to say with that is it completely depends on you what you want to get out of an accelerator, whether that's a good choice for you. And the things which, and when you apply for an accelerator, when you get in, you just need to be really clear on what you actually want to get out of it. So um, the usual kind of things you would get out of it is, I mean, the one which is absolutely the biggest one for if you get into StartMed is the network. So just even having all those mentors, um, VCs, angels, 
operators, other founders, alumni, honestly, alumni is the biggest one. Um, and actually the biggest and most important one is actually the cohort around you is, is invaluable. So even just for the network, especially if you don't know that many people and that many people in your stage is invaluable. The other thing that people want to get out of accelerators uh, essentially help with identifying, um, am I onto something? So it's kind of like a, hey, I know there's something there, there's some kind of problem there, but I'm not entirely sure uh, how to validate it, how to um, find it. So that's kind of like the help on um, finding the problem in the market. Um, and then if you pass that stage, then with help, help with sales and marketing. So again, just for yourself, like decide which part of all of that do you want to get help with? And apart from all of that, the, uh, the obvious other reason why lots of founders join as well is actually fundraising. So once you know you're onto something and you know you can be growing really fast, there's actually, it's a really good pathway to join an accelerator for 12 weeks, grow 10, 20% week on week, show that awesome growth curve. And off the back of that, it raised whatever it is, like a million or $2 million round. So mm -hmm. we've had lots of startups which went with one focus into the accelerator, which is like, I want to raise a million dollars, went super hard for 12 weeks and then managed to raise around even before demo day. Mm. So many great success stories, um, especially from, from start, mate. I, I, I suspect we've got lots of founders here saying, putting their hands up, I'm convinced, I want to get in, I want to do it, I think I'm the right company to do it. Uh, you would have seen thousands of founders through the process and, you know, personally mentored hundreds in the program since you've been involved in Startmate. Um, I guess you have a unique position here in sort of access to so many early stage founders and sort of looking at, at what makes for a great founder. I guess when you're looking at a founding team, are there any particular traits um, that stick out to you that uh, makes it more likely for that team to get into the program or, or be successful in the program? Hmm. Great question. And I mean, overall, um, there, is, there are definitely common traits of great founders and there's definitely exceptions as well. So like everything I'm saying, take it with a grain of salt as well, because it's not, it's not all true either, because there's so many exceptions in all those different rules. But the best, the best founders who I've seen to get into start and then succeed off the back of it, um, I would actually say the core two things, uh, communication and feedback. Communication, what I mean by that is um, the best founders, it's actually pretty simple, are really fast to reply. So similar to what Adam Milgram said about me, it was like um, the best founders actually are just really, um, really, really good communicator. They do weekly or monthly updates every single month on time with lots of detail. They know when to ask for help. They have a great follow-up process where they say thank you after a session and what you what they're gonna do. Best thing you can do, the worst thing you can do in a meeting is um, have a meeting, get lots of advice, and never do anything with it, and never talk to that person again. The beauty, uh, the best founders literally have that meeting, follow up with an email afterwards, being like, those are the three things I learned, those are the two things I'm gonna do off the back of it. In a month's time, follow up with an email again, being like, thanks so much for the advice. Those are the things I said I'm gonna do, and I did them all, and you just like close the loop. So the best founders are just incredible communicators and um, not just with the follow up and the meeting itself, but also with the vision. So they can beautifully create the picture of like, this is in 10 years time, what it's going to look like. And those are the 10 steps I need to get there. And this is where I am right now. And the second part, which I mentioned was feedback. So this is a really hard one. And this is one where um, you will need um, a lot of practice as well but you will get so much feedback over your lifetime, especially if you ask for it. And during Accelerator even more so, and mental whiplash is really real. Like everybody will be telling you something different. And um, that's just because what you're doing has never been done before. And that's also to say like, nobody knows better than you do as a founder because you're the closest person to the problem. So what the best founders do is actually, they're able to, to really drill into the feedback and find the kernel of truth and just block out everything else. So they're like, all right, I've sampled all the 100 pieces of feedback. Those 20 are what I think is true. I'm gonna go and have, I'm gonna try and go and prove it. And for the other 80 people, you're just gonna be like, hey, thanks so much for your feedback. Um, I'm not gonna take it on right now. I will, be, I will come back to that later because I think this is our focus right now. So just being and having that backbone of being able to say, no, thank you. And this is what I'm focused on right now. That's what the best funders do. 
The worst thing is if you're completely paralyzed by all that feedback from everybody and you don't do anything. Mm. Uh, totally. It's so funny you mentioned Adam Milgram in amongst there and, <laughs> and following up because we had, um, we had a, a session with him, uh, might have been later last year, an investment session, and, and he mentioned that as an investor, so Adam Milgram's an a angel investor and venture partner at um, Giant Leap Fund, a VC, and he does lots of office hours and meets with lots of lots of startups, um, you know, literally thousands who come to him asking him for money. And he said, you know what? Only about 10% of the founders he meets with actually follow up with him. And so his tip was, well, just to stand out from the crowd, whether you've got a good business or not, just follow up, just drop the line saying, thank you. Follow up in a month's time saying, this is what I learned. This is what I did, even if it's dim- dismissing the advice. So it's, it's, a, it's really cool to, to bring those two together. So I also want to take um, the segue of sort of once you're in, ex- uh, in the accelerator program. So moving into now for the founders out there, they've applied, they've gotten in. Um, I know there's a couple on this call. I'm going to give you some, some really great value right now that have just got an into accelerator programs and they're sort of sitting there wondering, can they negotiate terms? Um, all the accelerators say terms are non-negotiable, but then they kind of can. In your experience, um, I'm going to ask a two part question, you know, can they negotiate terms, but how can founders do a, a, good, a, a good job or a better job of negotiating for themselves? Hmm. Um, Let's park the question for a second, uh, but absolutely, let me try to remember that. So negotiating terms, um, even before that, like when you said follow up, actually, I just wanted to give a shout out actually to one of our startups. Um, and I'm just going to post a link into the chat. If you do want to have a great follow up and actually just say thank you to somebody, just jump on there. It's actually a startup, which is in the current start date cohort. And you can literally send somebody $5 as a thank you, but they actually don't get $5. They get to choose which charity it goes to. So the startup is called Good Things, and that's just a beautiful kind of, um, it's just even just a like gesture, whatever it is, even if it's mm. just $1, right? It's just a really beautiful gesture to just like, you've been appreciated and you actually get to choose to share it yourself. Cool. But um, back to your question of um, how can startups negotiate better? I mean, two questions there, I guess, which is one with accelerators, two with um, VCs or afterwards. So one with accelerators, um, unfortunately, I can't speak for any of the other ex- accelerators because I just don't know the terms and how they invest. But at StartMed, I can um, confidently say um, we don't negotiate with startups because our terms are super standard and um, com- completely founder friendly. Where um, if you don't have a valuation, we invest $75,000 at a million dollar valuation every single time. And if you have um, raised in the past, whatever it is, we match your latest valuation. So make it super, super simple. We are super founder friendly. If you have raised, we just match your latest terms. If not, it's a million dollar valuation. The only exception in there is if you already have more than two, three hundred thousand dollars in revenue a year, at that stage, we can talk about it. And it's not necessarily a negotiation. We would again, just go based on whatever customer, uh, whatever, um, whatever investor conversation you've had in the past as well. And the second thing is um, what you asked about um, negotiating with other parties apart from accelerators, which is a really interesting topic here where um, I actually I just had a workshop with the Startmate cohort actually, and I was um, giving them a bit of a breakdown of how fundraising roughly works in the general. And um, one of the questions was, um, at what stage do I set a price on my valuation? Which was really interesting. Like, do I tell it straight out? Do I do a partner meeting? At what stage do I do that? And um, the best things I've seen from, from startups are essentially you say how much you're raising and how much you need for the next 18 months because roughly 18 months is, is kind of what you're raising for. And then you actually don't set the valuation itself. You just, and then when VCs or angels ask you what valuation are you raising at, you actually just say, say back, like, I'm letting the market price my startup. What do you think my startup should be worth? And at that stage, you just get feedback from four, five, 10 different angels and VCs. And you're going to start forming an opinion of what should your startup be actually valued at, at the stage it is. So rather than setting yourself a ceiling, you actually just get feedback from the market. Mm, so yeah, that's a um, yeah. great tip. Great tip. Uh, and so in the program itself, uh, from the mentoring angle, I have it on good authority that you are often uh, rated one of the top mentors in start in, in start mate. Um, from the lens of the, the founder, though, I guess, you know, going into a program, they're looking for a 
uh, mentors. It's probably one of the key reasons they're going into the program. Uh, what makes for great mentors? So you spoke about the whiplash in terms of receiving advice, but for the founders here searching around for different accelerators to join, they're probably critiquing how much money do I get and who are the mentors? So um, it's interesting that I hear that you are rated as one of the top mentors, not because um, you are not fantastic, but when you look at the names on your website of the mentors, you know, it's Rachel Newman, Jody Oster, Didier Elzinga, like, you know, the biggest names in tech. So I guess what I'm, it's not always about the, the biggest name. So what should founders be looking out for to get that mentor experience when they're judging the accelerator program? Mm, yeah, super interesting. Um, yeah, super interesting, actually. Um, so again, I'll split it into two questions again. So like the one is how do you judge an accelerator based on the mentors? And the second one is once you actually are looking for a mentor, how do you judge if it's a good mentor or not? Um, so the first part is how do you judge an accelerator with the mentors they have as part of it? That's a really interesting question because um, if you just look at people's websites, it's quite deceiving in a way because um, people just put any kind of names and faces on there, which would have been um, marginally attached to that accelerator at any point in time. What you really want to be asking, and ideally you can even just head up the program manager, is who are the most engaged mentors in the program? Because it is so much about the engagement. Because even though you might have a big name on the website, it it, that mentor might have been part of like one talk for one hour, like 10 years ago kind of thing. What's really important is like, who's actually going to be part of your cohort? Like who's actually going to be investing their time into your development? So I would actually be asking that question first. Um, so at start and completely say like for us, all of our mentors invest a personal money into each cohort. So um, some have more, some have less time. So you can totally ask me that question as well. The second thing would be if you were to look at people's websites or choose mentors in an accelerator, the best mentors, and this is a, a definitely a generalization, are the founders and ex-founders who are two or three steps ahead of you. Like it's often not the person who has a billion dollar company and who has a huge brand. It is often somebody who's been through the journey which you've been through and is two years ahead of you, have, has maybe raced around or whatever it is because they can give you the real tangible, no bullshit kind of advice and help that you want. And that's often not the biggest names. That's just somebody in your industry, in your space, um, who can give you very tactical help and advice. How do you choose a mentor once you are in an accelerator or when you're looking for mentors? Here, it comes back so much to the person. Like um, even though somebody might look great in terms of industry and experience, it actually comes so back so much back to do you get um, along with them on a personal level? So what we do in StartMate, we expose all of our startups to actually almost way too many mentors in the first two weeks. Like we overload people with, in the first two weeks, you're gonna meet with a hundred people. But the reason why we do that is because after so many conversations, you can benchmark people against each other. You can see in those 10 minute back-to-back -back conversations really quickly of who do you click with? It's so much about like, you meet somebody for one person and you instantly know like, you're gonna be my friend for life. And um, similar with mentors, like from those hundred people, you actually really quickly narrow down, like those are the five people who are most important to me and who can give me most, who are also, like it's also a two-way street. It's not necessarily who are you most interested in, but are they actually interested in you as well? Um, so yeah, my advice here of, of, um, would be the one of um, at first go wide and then just see who you get along on a personal um, level with and, and then just choose those kind of, three to five people who will be instrumental in your journey because you can never maintain the maintain more than those five to 10 very strong relationships. You heard it first from start mate, number one mentor. <laughs> um, so just, uh, just, just sort of rounding out the, uh, how to win in an accelerator program, um, sort of conversation, uh, again, on the founder patterns, do you see any founder, uh, patterns in founders or founding teams that uh, do better through a program than others. So I guess this is coming to the tips for people um, who are on here to know how do I do really well once I'm in the program. You said, you know, only really one out of 10 go all the way and slam dunk. So how, who does better in accelerator programs and, you know, what tips do you have out there for, for founders out there who are in a program right now or about to start? Yeah. Um, two things here product and um 
in feedback again. So maybe I'll start with the feedback piece because I'm just going to um, say again what I said earlier. The best founders are the ones who can actually just not get paralyzed by all that feedback and really go hard in what they believe and what they think is the right thing. Um, the, sec the first part, um, I just said this, our product. So, um, so here it's kind of interesting in um, the best time you can go for an accelerator is when you have something that's working and that you can build on and you've kind of launched some kind of MVP. Because almost like the, the, the hardest thing is if you're still building the basics of the product in the first 10 weeks of the accelerator and you always need to tell people, oh yeah, another week, another week, another week. And then in the last two weeks, you can then hit it hard or whatever. Like you just start meeting people, right? The best thing in an accelerator is if you can launch with something, you've got something to go out to the market with, you can meet all those people, get lots of feedback and then keep iterating on that product rather than start something from completely scratch. So that would be probably um, my advice here and um, just have something which you can play with already rather than building it from completely scratch. Mm. I hope everyone got that down. If not, there is going to be a recording so you can listen to it again. So we've got about five more minutes before I want to get to some of the, the Q and A. So if you do have a question, um, keep pumping your questions through. Uh, I want to focus a little bit on just some general advice for early stage startups right now, thinking about the future um, accelerator program or, or not. I guess, are there any, any skills gaps you see um, in early stage founders at the moment in Australia, anything that particularly sort of sits as a sort of a, a missing skill that you wish early stage founders did some more work on? Not necessarily actually. Like I genuinely think Australian and New Zealand founders are some of the, of the best in the world. You've got access to some incredible resources and the ecosystem is really supported. There are only skills, okay, maybe, well, the only skills which I would compare to Australia and New Zealand to globally possibly is just underselling yourself. That's especially when you pitch to investors and customers is a very kind of Australian thing where you like just the classic tall poppy syndrome. Um, at that stage, I always want to say like, you found a company to solve a huge problem. You are the best person to solve that problem. So never undersell yourself. Genuinely position yourself in the best possible light. And, and just go out there and do it. Um, so I would just say that probably. Yeah. So it's not necessarily a skill missing, it's more like just believe in yourself. Yeah. For what it's worth, I totally, totally agree with you as well. I, I see, we see that all the time. Uh, another one, a, a little bit more philosophical on, on the future of um, startups and, and business, you know, most people here are building businesses of the future. It's, it's for the next 10 years, you know, um, I guess, has there been a shift in, in the startup space to, or have you seen any shifts um, kind of away from that sort of unicorn hyper growth model that kind of we work, Uber, Lyft were kind of rolling over the past 10 years. Um, you know, is it, is, are those still the business models that are being pumped out today by early stage founders? Should founders be thinking like that? Or has there, do you think there's been a bit more of a shift to sort of sustainability, reaching profitability a bit earlier? I guess for the early stage founders here, just for their, their thinking on what to aspire to, what type of business to build. Um, how do you see that dynamic between sort of what I call the unicorn hunting um, type of model, growth, 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 versus kind of a bit slower growth, but more sustainable um, you know, there's been different times in history when either models are favored. What do you, what do you think is in vogue at the moment and where's, where's early stage business going in the startup space? Yeah. I mean, overall there's always fluctuations in the two of them just almost based on VC funding. Um, overall, there's never been more VC funding in the market than it has now. Um, there's a really good blog post by Paul Graham, the founder of um, Y Combinator called, um, I think it's called Default Dead. And what I wanted to say with that actually is um, you cannot be both. That's actually the most important thing to consider. You can either be VC funded and go and aim to be a billion dollar company, or you can be a good cash flow model and sustainable business. Um, sorry, you can do that as well, being a cash flow model and sustainable business. But especially in the early days, you just need to decide for yourself which one you want to be. And you can build an incredible company just through cash flow. And, um, and building a stable, growing company. 
But if you want to be taking VC funding, you need to be able to believe yourself and make other people believe that you can be this like hundred million dollar revenue business. Um, and the blog post for Paul Graham is actually a really interesting comparison because he gives you a really good breakdown of what does it mean to be default life and default dead. Where um, right now, if you um, took your cash flow, what do you have in the bank, and took your growth over the last couple of months and how much you're growing in revenue, and you projected your burn and your cash flow forward, just literally stably as you've been doing, most startups will run out of money at some stage. So being aware of that is super, impo is super important because then you need to decide for yourself, am I now going to raise VC and when, or am I going to get it to a cash flow kind of um, stable business? So, and most startups actually don't do the calculation and then they get surprised when they run out of money. And I know this seems like a really, really simple trick and a really simple tip, but um, it's surprising how few people actually think about it. So, um, so, so to be clear, uh, great answer. I just want to know from Startmate's perspective, uh, are you only taking companies that are kind of going down that VC funding path or would you also look at companies that are um, doing the slower sustainable model? Yeah, so um, no, great question. So for us, it's, we always invest in the most ambitious founders. So we always need to be able to believe that you will be a $100 million revenue business. In every single one of our companies, we believe that you can actually do that. And um, that being said, we don't, we, every single uh, startup also in Startmate has their own path. Not, not all of them will be raising VC straight out of the accelerator. Not all of them um, need it either. Um, so maybe a story would be good at this stage where um, one of our startups um, in a cohort five years ago um, actually just paid out the dividend, which is unheard of in startup life. And it returned half of our fund. So even from a financial perspective, it actually is a great outcome. Um, but it just shows you that there's actually lots of different ways to succeed. Um, yeah. Yeah. And definitely one of the benefits of an accelerated program is that flexibility. All right. Well, we're, that's it for our bit of the conversation. Uh, we have what looks like 20 plus questions here to get through. I've just done a quick peruse and there are some fantastic questions uh, I would love to answer, but I'm actually wondering, Michael, so that the, um, participants can get maximum benefit from you. Perhaps do you want to have a look here and, and just yeah. pick out a question that you think you would answer really well that could be really valuable? Well, feel free to send me those questions afterwards as well and I can um, um, answer them. We've got eight minutes left. So if you want to, I can actually run really quickly for all of them. Oh, um, amazing. Let's, <laughs> let's see how so, Mr. Productivity does uh, it. What are the best ways you'd recommend to prove idea validation pre-revenue? Um, talk to lots and lots of customers and um, ask them what are the top three problems you're solving. If your problem isn't in the top three problems, it's not a problem with, um, well, which they would be putting money towards. So like the answer, super simple, is talk to lots and lots of customers. Which type does something like why come in a, um, oh, I just lost it. Oh, no, I just lost it there. Should I continue working and studying in the area of entrepreneurship if I currently have not identified any good problem spaces to solve? Um, kind of interesting like um i am under the feeling and i actually might be speaking against with you because <laughs> i think you teach at the uh, um, university right i always the one of like entrepreneurship and startups is just something you do you can't learn so it, you actually just need to jump in there and do it yourself whether it's joining or founding a company and um, it is best learned actually by doing and um, so should you continue to be working and studying um honestly with coming up with a um, startup idea, it's a burning problem which you really want to be solving. So it's usually something that bothers you every single day of your life. And if it doesn't, then you will not want to dedicate the next 10 to 15 years of life to it. Um, founding has been often described by like chewing glass and you need to love chewing glass. So unless you feel so strongly about it, um, really hard to find this, found a business. Rapid growth for minimal short-term income versus steady growth for small and self-sustaining revenue. Which startup would you invest in? <laughs> um, absolutely the rapid growth one. Um, so because from an investment perspective, that is the one um, which will return my money in a way. Um, that being said, on the public markets, I probably would do it differently. <laughs> but in terms of startups, because you've got some illiquid um, investment, your risk-return ratio is just very different. Which type does something like Y Combinator fits in 
in four types. Oh, um, why I think the answer is where does Y Combinator fit in? So it essentially fits into the venture capital model, which was the fourth type. I have come across a few accelerators in Australia where they have fee to join. Oh, well, a non-existent application process. How are these accelerators different than the application process ones? Um, interesting. Um, I would actually say that almost like accelerators which charge you to be joining aren't accelerators. They are education programs. That's almost I would more closely compared to a university rather than a true accelerator. And because what you want is somebody investing in your success rather than charging you for it. Um, Sasha, so, how do you... Oh, sorry. So I'm just saying, Michael, I'm been, the audience can't necessarily see these questions that we're oh. answering. So um, maybe if you could just read out the question you're going to answer, um, it'd be great for them. Oh, sorry. Absolutely. Thanks so much for flagging. All right. The question is, how do you quantify success from your cohort? You mentioned hundreds of stuff, but is there a valuation ticket box? Um, great question. So in terms of success from the cohort, um, from wearing my investor hat, absolutely, it is a valuation question because ultimately this is what will return the money for us. Um, there is... We measure our success for the accelerator in two terms. One is valuation from an investment side. The other one is NPS from an experience side. That is, if, if nothing else, actually NPS is probably more important. Emma, rocket seeder for early stage startups in the food and X sector. Um, I think that's an advertising for rocket seeder. Go check out rocket yeah. seeder. I actually don't know <laughs> them. Um, but I don't think that's a question. Anonymous, a follow-up question to clarify. One business with a product suitable for both business users or consumers. There are two business models, B2C to reach massive users, but hard to get revenue. And the other model is B2B to get revenue quicker, but less users, which would you value more? Um, so, okay, B2C versus B2B. Um, so it's a bit hard to get revenue, revenue quicker. Honestly, I don't have an answer there. Very different types of businesses and very different types of risk profiles as well. I'm sorry, I don't, actually don't have an answer there. I really like, no, I like the next question you're about to read from Sasha. From a Sasha, do you ha ever have two companies solving the same problem as part of the same core? Is there ever a conflict or is that powerful? Love the question. Yes, we had it actually in one of our cohorts before. We had two businesses which were in very, very similar spaces. Um, ultimately, what we do is um, just tell them, both exactly the same thing, which is don't sh ever share anything that you wouldn't share outside the wider group. But it is powerful if they want to collaborate to work on that together. And um, usually they try to stay out of the separate ways. They both know the market is huge and you are more likely to die because of no product market fit rather than competition. <laughs> so my, uh, that would be my advice over the, um, for that problem. Somebody anonymous, lots of the US-based accelerators insist on creating a US entity. Does having a US C Corp affect the startup ability to raise Series A money from Australian VCs and angels? Um, overall, no, you can still raise money as a US VC, uh, sorry, as a US incorporated entity. Um, there are restrictions for US VCs, and you can actually look that up in the register online as well. It's something called ESVCLP. Most of the VC funds are ESVCLPs, which means they have a restriction that they can only invest in 20% um, of non-Australian businesses. But that if a VC loves you, it, will, it usually does not um, restrict you from getting money. Right, so just a time check, maybe yeah. one more from you. And then I really want to ask you one that's a bit further down the cool. list. Righty. Well, one more then from Anna up here. Thanks for your um, one more, if I can please. How do we accelerate a program? Take start as an example. Think about exit strategies and typical holding period for investments. Love the question. StartBet is, comp is actually quite different again to any other VC funds. VC funds usually have a 10 year investment horizon plus two one year extensions. At StartMed, we actually have an open investment um, period, so we can hold our investments as long as we want to. And the way I think about exit strategies is that I don't think about them because I love investing in founders who genuinely want to have the company forever and change the future rather than already think about how they're going to be leaving that business. So yeah, that'd be my answer. Boom. <laughs> that was a lot of questions there. All right, so one more, one more to close off with here because um, I know we have lots of founders who are applying to programs. Maybe they've been unsuccessful in some programs and, and the questions around um, if you do get knocked back, how do you actually get feedback from the uh, accelerator and then, you know, can you reapply? Do you ever see people get knocked back and then reapply and get in the next year? 
Absolutely. So um, here, definitely don't get discouraged. Um, we often make wrong choices as well. Absolutely keep reapplying. We've had plenty of startups in Startmate who have applied five, six times and then got in and then went on to be really, really good. Um, in terms of getting feedback on your application, that's often a hard one. Where unfortunately at Startmate, we, we don't give feedback and that's something I hate. But unfortunately, that's unavoidable in a way that we get 600 applications and there's just no way we can provide feedback on every single one of them. You do get feedback from us if you go through the interview stage uh, because at that stage, we assess companies um, in a lot more detail. So we have, we have roughly 40 companies per cohort which go for interview days. Um, yeah. Sure. So it is, but I, you know, I guess the feedback comes in, you need to change something, you need to do something different. And there's plenty of advisors out there who I'm sure can, um, if you are getting knocked back from programs, you know, you can chat to an advisor, chat to a mentor, you know, I know there's plenty of office hours around that can, that can help you out there. Michael, thank you so much. That was a, an incredible hour. So much, um, so many uh, great pearls of wisdom there. To round it out, we're going to send a follow-up email to everyone um, that will have some tips and, and little tidbits from today's conversation. Uh, Michael, I'll chat to you afterwards. Perhaps we'll find a way we, to, to send some answers to um, the other people who, who ask questions and we couldn't get to them. So everyone, thank you so much for coming. Um, it was a great conversation for me. What really sticks out is, um, you know, present your best self. Accelerator programs are there to support. Don't be discouraged uh, if you don't get in the first time. Um, there's no one way of doing anything. Uh, and it's all about improvement, Im you know, improving from your first conversation, your first interview to your second, once you're in the program, you know, always just thinking about improvement. And I guess a, a key takeaway for me is just how you can interact with, with mentors and um, put your best foot forward by just following up, saying thank you and being responsive. So thanks all for coming. Um, stay tuned for the next uh, installment of, of Control N. Um, it will come, we've got some big announcements in September. I believe it's going to be announced in, the, in our newsletter shortly. So if you enjoyed this conversation, there's going to be a couple more in, in September that you should definitely come along to. Again, Michael, just want to say thank you so much for uh, your honesty and, and coming in today and, and supporting the ecosystem and everyone um, at home. Thanks for, uh, thanks for tuning in for uh, another installment of Control N. Thank you. Thanks so much.